We all want to welcome you to the 1130 Wednesday Lunch and Bible Study from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, we are currently in a series on Wednesday on spiritual gifts. Uh, we're taking it out of the book of 1 Corinthians. You'll, you'll recall from our previous studies that spiritual gifts are listed in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, and Ephesians 4. And we went through that whole list the other day and narrowed it down and explained to you why there are 19 gifts uh, given to the church uh, at Pentecost uh, to begin the formational work of the ministry of the local church. Now, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the Greek grammar, Paul's Greek grammar, of nine spiritual gifts that he isolated. He separated, because we, we looked last week, we looked at 8 through 10 and 28 through 30, where he listed gifts. What I want to call your attention to is that he separated those gifts. And what he did is he separated nine spiritual gifts out of the 19. He, he, he separated nine of them. They're listed in chapter 12, 8, 9, and 10. And that's very important because they're connected to 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10. And you're going to have to really pay attention today, like Peter said, when you study Paul, you've got to have your thinking cap on. He said that in 2 Peter 3.16. And that's true for today because I'm going to show you some really unique stuff that Paul does in the Greek language that's just phenomenal. And you, you can't see it in the English, and so I'm going to show Well, you could, but I've got to show it to you. Uh, at least that's my heart's desire is to kind of show it to you so that you can get an idea because he's taking these nine gifts out of 12 and he's going to take them over to 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10. And he's going to do it again in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 20 through 22. And it's, it's just interesting because he's building up. He's building on some things. Well, here we are in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, and then we're going to have a word of prayer. Uh, verses 8, 9, and 10. Oh, well, now, we've studied everything else prior to it. He says, For to one is given the word of wisdom, speaking about gifts, through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, these are, that's a gift now. And to another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. And to another, effects of miracles. And to another, prophecies. And to another, the distinguishing of spirits. Uh, to another, tongues, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. Now, if you'll take just a moment, you will see that there are nine gifts listed there. Uh, we showed them to you last week. We showed them to you last week. But we're going to show you some really phenomenal things in the Greek language that Paul did that you might not be able to see it in the English without some explanation to it. So we're going to look at these nine gifts today, how Paul identified them and separated them which is going to be important to next week's class on 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10. So let's pause for a moment. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality in the Christian life under the new covenant is personal sin. Could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. These sins need to be confessed according to 1 John 1, 9 to get you out of carnality and put you back into the indwelling spiritual ministry of the Holy Spirit. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, homo legale means to name or cite it, the Bible declares what sin is. People don't. Bible does. And when you're aware of that, 
that's what you confess. Okay? So you have to study the new covenant. What are the sins of the new covenant church age? You have to study that. You have to study the New Testament. Go from Matthew uh, through Revelation. That's, that's the storybook. Of course, 11, uh, I mean, you have to study the Bible is my point. Now, he says that if you confess your sins, he's God is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The cleansing takes you back to verse 7 and takes you back to the cross of Jesus Christ, to the cross. As a Christian, I go back to the cross because it was on the cross that he paid for the cleansing work of sin in the, in the believer's life, past, present, and future. And so when he says, if you confess your sins, uh, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you. That cleansing takes you back to the cross as a believer to confess my sin because I've lived in carnality for my own desires rather than the desire of God to please him. I've pleased myself. I've identified my sin. It could be mental attitude, sins of the tongue, or overt. I'm going to confess them for the cleansing, not for my salvation now. I'm a believer at the cross for my sanctification, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit in my life, because I'm, I'm to walk by the Spirit, not the flesh, Galatians 5, 16 to 17. So I'm going to give you a moment to do that. Those who are visiting with us today at the lunch hour, you know, this is Wednesday luncheon hour. Uh, you eat and I teach, and I'm going to feed you out of the Word of God. And so let's take a moment. You pause for a moment, make sure there's no unconfessed sin in your life so the Holy Spirit can teach you the truth and recall it to your life. Teach and recall. You know, that's John 14, 15, and 16. You should study that, those passages on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. When he comes, this is a ministry he will have. And he, he came at Pentecost. That's Acts 2. So let's pray. I give you a moment of silence, then I'm going to close in prayer. Now, Father, I want to thank you today for these that have come our way by the Internet. For whatever way they clicked on to us, Father, may they understand the, the importance of it as far as Bible study. We'll teach them things that they've probably never been taught before about spiritual gifts and the spiritually gifted ministries. And this is really important, these nine gifts that Paul talks about. They're just nine of 19. But he talks about them because they're, they were causing problems within the church, a misunderstanding about these gifts and how they function. And he talks about them in verses 8, 9, and 10, and he talks again about them in verses 28, 29, 30 in chapter 12. He'll talk about them again in 13 and again in 14. But here we are, Father, looking at some... Uh, technical aspects of the Greek language, and it's not really technical, technical. It's a first-year Greek student could learn this um, and, and should be able to know what I'm talking about. But listen, even if they haven't, Father, the Holy Spirit is the great teacher anyhow. He will teach them the significance, importance of why it was written in Koine Greek. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's go back to our passage for a moment. I'm going to talk about uh, six aspects today of um, the Greek grammar and how important it is to these nine gifts in the way Paul taught. It's really, really important. You really have to understand chapter 12, 8, 9, and 10 in order to understand the 13th chapter, 8, 9, and 10, and the 14th chapter, 20, 21, and 22. You, you'll never be able to put these together unless you study that in the way, in consistency of Paul's teaching. He taught chapter 12 first, so then he could teach chapter 13, and then he could teach chapter 14. I mean, it's, that's why it's in the sequence it's in. That's for sure. So this is really important for you because we're going to, today we're going to deal with this, Next week, we're going to deal with 13, and the following week, we're going to deal with 14, and I'm done. 
okay? I'm, I'm, just taking, I'm just walking through. This is my 47th year of teaching this to my church, and it is the last year I, I hope that I'm going to teach on it because we have so much information on the, our website on this very subject. There's no reason for me to teach it anymore to my congregation. I may teach it to other congregations, but for my congregation, uh, we have... We've taught this a lot because it's so significantly important to the local church. So here we are under point number one. This is really important because you can't see this in the English, but I'm going to show it to you in verse 8. Four to, four to one is given. Four to one. Four to one. Now what you can't see is Mende, Mende, M-E-N-D-E. Paul used it. You, it's a, a common Greek, and Paul uses it a lot. It's a common Greek way of setting up a sequence of ideas. One takes you to two, and two to three, and three to four, and four to five, four to six. It's a sequence. It's called the Men, M-E-N, Day, D-E, sequence. Now, and so we're going to have them. And if, if you have a study guide, you will see that men, M-E-N, is used with word of wisdom. And then day is going to be used with the word of knowledge, not with the word faith. It will be used with the gift of healing. It will be D-E. De, it will be used with the effects of miracles. It will be used with prophecy. It will be used with distinguishing, uh, distinguishing spirits. It will not be used with various kinds of tongues, but it will be used with interpretation. In the Greek language, if you have a Greek Bible, you can see that. Now, you can't see it in English because it doesn't, doesn't show it. But this is the way you set up a sequence Men, day. Men always starts it out, and then it goes day, 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 day in a sequence. But you can see that when it came to faith, you can't see it in English, but in the Greek text, in the Greek text of this passage, there's no day with faith, and there's no D-E, there's no D-E with various kinds of tongues. Now, when that happens, it breaks the sequence. <laughs> Aren't you happy you came today? Because there's no way you can see that in English. But if you have a if you have a Greek Bible and you look in there, you can see D E if you know how to if you know how to get it, a delta and an E, a D and an E. Well, anyhow, if you live around here, you could come when we teach Greek. We teach, you know, we teach three years of Greek and, and Hebrew. So if you, and we have a school called School of Biblical Thunder. You could come and go to that. It don't cost you a thing, and you could learn it. But, but anyhow, there's a sequence. It begins with men, and then it goes day, 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 day. That's point. It starts with one, and then it just flows a sequence. One, two, three, four, five, six. It goes nine times, except there's a break. There's a break at faith and a break at various kinds of tongues because there's no day with it. Okay? Now, I laid this out under point one. I laid it out for you to see that. I wrote it out in the Greek where you got man and then you got day, 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 day. Then you got a break and then you got day, day, day. You got a break. Okay, so that's really important that you understand that Paul has listed these nine gifts under a mende sequence in the Greek language, and he broke them twice. He broke the sequence twice. Point number two is that's important. I, mean, it's, I can't tell you how that important is. This is huge in this passage. Point number two, Paul used a relative pronoun, hos, H-O-S. 
it's in it's translated in verse eight for to one the word to one is a relative pronoun to one and is used with men to start the sequence now you don't need you do not need a relative pronoun to start the sequence Paul used it because it goes with two other important aspects of the way Paul laid these nine gifts out alas and heteros now if you have your Greek if you have your Bible, if you have your sheet of paper from us, then you've got it all laid out. If not, I'm going to show it to you in a minute. Hoss, to one, and then you have alas, and you have heteros. Now listen, how you, listen to me how you translate them. To one, that's hoss, H-O-S, that's a relative pronoun. Then you've got A-L-L-O-S, alas. That means to another of the same kind. And then heteros, to one, to another of the same kind. Heteros, to another of a different kind. Watch this now. Now watch this. In verse 8, Paul begins to one, he uses men and hoss, to one, and he, he lists word of wisdom. Then he goes day, now we're in a sequence, he uses day, alas, word of knowledge. Word of wisdom, alas means another of the same kind, like the word of wisdom is the word of knowledge. Then he breaks the sequence. There's no day with the word faith. But heteros is there. Heteros. So right there, you need to write in the word heteros with the word faith. Heteros. A different kind of faith. And he broke the sequence. Then he comes back to the list in a sequence. He says, De Allah's gift of healing, De Allah's gifts of miracle, De Allah's prophecy, De Allah's distinguishing spirits. one of another. Then there's a break. When you come to various kinds of tongues, there's a break. There's no D-E. He broke the sequence. And he added the word heteros of a different kind of tongues. Languages. Glossia. Languages. Which you, you, which you can see 15 of them in, sec, in Acts 2. These are the Jews that have come from other nations to visit and speaking. They, they're fluent in the language of, their, of the country they've come from as well as the Hebrew, which they learned as young people. You get, are you getting that? You go, oh, 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 I'm so confused. Come on, come on, come on, come on. They got a sequence. Man day. He breaks it, though, at faith, and he breaks the sequence. Twice. Once with faith and once with various kinds of tongues. Broke the sequence. Point number three. Paul broke the sequence in these nine gifts 
twice. Therefore, divided them into three groups. That's how you do this stuff. He broke the sequence. With not putting a day there, he broke the sequence. And when you step back and look, then you've got three groups. You've got word of wisdom, word of knowledge, one group. A, a second group, faith, gifts of healing, effects of miracles, prophecy, and discerning spirits. Got another break, no day, and heteros, just like heteros with faith. And then you have this group, various kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues. So you got three groups. Now, why did Paul do that? I'll tell you why. So that you could understand when he gets to chapter 13, 8, 9, and 10. And you're going to have to know this to know that. You're going to have to know this to know 13, 8, 9, and 10. And you're going to have to know both of these to understand 14, 20 through 22. This is the way Paul teaches. This is the way Paul writes. And for somebody that, listen, that you don't have to be an expert in the language to know what I just said. This is first year Greek. It's simple. It's not complicated. It's, it, this is Koine Greek. It's not classical Greek. This is Koine. It's, 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 it's street simple. Koine is street, is a street language. It's, it's simple. Kind of like Jesus teaching in parables. That was simple Hebrew. Connected to something in everyday life. Well, anyhow, well, you really got to get this. You say, look, and I hear this all the time. I, listen, I go to church. I've gone to church for all my life. I've never heard anything like this. I, I know. What, what can I tell you? I mean, your pastor doesn't teach the language. He probably learned it in, in, in seminary. Uh, and didn't think it would be relevant to the people in the pew, but is it? <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness, is it ever. So, in the Greek language, we have now three groups. Paul grouped them. Remember, left out the day and added heteros, a different kind of. Point number four. See, I'm trying to walk you through it. What do you mean this is too heavy for you? This is, this, this is the word of God. I'm teaching you the word of God. It was written in the Greek language. It was written in Koine Greek. That's why I went to school. When I realized I had the gift if, as teacher, if I want to go, if I want to pastor a church, I've got to know the language of the Word of God to teach my people. I love it. I love to know this. This makes so much sense when you read 12, 13, and 14. When I put this together, you're going to go like, holy macro. I hope you will. I hope you'll stay with me on this subject because, you know, you can remain ignorant and agnostic believer. But why would you do that? I don't know. I meet a lot of them, but I don't know why you would do that. I mean, you got to study, though. Here's point number four. Note that Paul used heteros, meaning a different kind of, with faith and with various kinds of tongues. Heteros, being used with faith, is referring to a different kind of faith that is acquired, is not acquired by Romans 10, 17. This is not a faith that comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. This is a supernatural uh, revelation of faith that comes outside the realm of studying the Bible and walking by faith. You walk by faith and not by sight. 
That's a Romans 10, 17. That's the faith cycle business. You need to study that and learn that. That's important in your life, faith cycle. This is not that kind of faith. This faith is not acquired by studying the Word of God. It is a supernatural gift given to the early church believers. And it was absolutely necessary to go with miracles and healings in the early church. This is the kind of thing Jesus was referring to with his disciples, this kind of faith. In Matthew, the 17th chapter, in Matthew 17, the disciples had been sent on a little mission to cast out demons, to show that they had the power of Christ in their life. 17, this whole thing starts at about 14, where the disciples are confronting a, a, a demon-possessed person that's called in the scriptures a lunatic. And the disciples couldn't cast them out, couldn't cure the, the person. Jesus, and so they, they brought in, they brought the, the, the lunatic to Jesus. As, now, he was demon-possessed. And Jesus answered and said, O oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Two questions. Bring him to me. Jesus rebuked him, the spirit, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. The disciples came to Jesus privately. <laughs> that was a lot of heat on him, wasn't it? Why couldn't we cast the demon out? Listen to what he said to him. Because of the littleness of your faith. And that is to believe the object. You know, faith has to have a working object. What should have been their working object? Now listen to me, this is important. What should have been the working object of their faith? The fact that Jesus was the only begotten Son of God and had powers over the demonic world. Read Luke, the fourth chapter, when he goes home and preaches in his, is a sign of who he was, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. That's why he refers this to them in that way. For truly I say to you, now watch this, if you have faith as a mustard seed, say, so no matter how little it is, it's what, what's the source? You know, mustard seed is very little, but it had a, it had a powerful gen, gene, a DNA. Because you could plant it and it'd become a, a big tree. Birds could nest in it. What is your faith in? Their faith to do this was the fact that Jesus was doing it as a sign that he had come to be the Savior of the world, that he was the Messiah. They went out in his name and could have done it. But when the demon resisted, they didn't know what to do. They could have simply said, in the name of Jesus, I command you. But they didn't.
if you have faith as a mustard seed, you shall say to the mountain, he actually said this mountain, points to it, move from here to there, and it shall be moved, and nothing shall be impossible for you. But this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. And then he goes on to talk to them. Faith to move a mountain from there to there. What's he comparing to is the ability for them to cast out a demon. They didn't use his name. I'm the, I'm the disciple of Jesus. Come out of him. And they just went like... <laughs> instead of... And they went... Oh, I, don't know I, can't do. I can't do... Okie Pinocchio, whoopie bow, come out. You know, some magical... Cannotation type thing. They could have went, oh, wait a minute. In the name of Jesus, by his authority, I say to you. See, look how he compared that, though. See, he's, this faith is going to be like that in the early church. And the disciples, until the canonization of the scriptures of the New Testament, the New Covenant, is going to have the ability to do this. It's got to be done the right way. It's a supernatural faith. It's not a faith that I can find. Where did you find it in the Word of God? You could, well, it's not there. You walk up some demon, somebody's demon possessed in the name of Jesus Christ. They could do that. A, a blind man, they could say to the blind man, pick up your bed and go home. They could, they could say, silver and gold have I not, but in the name of Jesus. This was good, as we'll see until the canon of Scripture. Is it early church stuff? Early church stuff. Showing that Jesus, though he's not on earth, has, still has the power. It comes through the Holy Spirit. And it comes through, uh, through people who are called Christians. Whether Jew or Gentile, male or female. Geez. See? Well, it's called a heteros faith. It means different. Then the kind of Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. This faith will be very important to the establishing of the scriptures under the new covenant, or what we call New Testament scriptures, those 27 books. And for the establishing of the church of Jesus Christ in the world in his absence. There you go to the book of Acts. If you want a great study on, well, just where would I find all that? Study the book of Acts. This faith shall be important, especially to the gifts of healing and the effects of miracles in the post-canon period of the church age. Which is just almost through all the writings, Right? I mean, the last book that's going to be written is Revelation somewhere around 100 A.D., and that's what we're talking about here. From 30 A.D. to 100 A.D. period, this is going to be dynamite stuff. Oh, jeez. I'm just telling you, if you'll come back next week, we'll be in the 13th chapter, I'm going to show you how important this is to that.
I'm just doing what Paul did. I'm just teaching first because you got to know this because doctrine is built on doctrine, precept on precept. Point five. Between now and next week, I'm going to give you a reading assignment. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27, read it. Because it shows you how gifts make up the body of Christ, the church, and its ministry. Be sure to read that. That will be important in next week. Every church age believer is given a spiritual gift at the moment of grace salvation, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 and 11 through 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 and then 11 through 13. The distribution of a spiritual gift, the moment of salvation in the church age, is one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit in the package of salvation. Well, go to our website, pull it down, read it. Look up the, the 50 things you receive at salvation. You can never lose any time in eternity. It's on our front page, 50 things, free 50 things or something like that. Pull it down, read it. What this means, and I want you to be sure you get this, that there are no ungifted believers in the church age. No, there is no such thing as one believer not having a spiritual gift. It's one of the things that is given, the eight works, one of them is the distribution of the spiritual gift that makes you a member of the body of Christ. Some people are arms, some people are ears, some people are nose. Your gift is not for you, it's for the body. Hearing is not for the ear, it's for the body. Sight is not for the eye, it's for the body. Read 1 Corinthians 12 through 27. It's very important. It will be very important for the rest of my study with you on spiritual gifts from Paul's writing in Corinthians. Point six in closing. Your spiritual gift is important to the church you attend. Since you received your gift of salvation, you should be able to study the gifts and pay attention to how God is using you in a church. What do you mean you don't go to church? <laughs> you don't go to a local church? If you live within 40 miles of Birmingham, come to ours. 40 miles? Yeah, it's like going to an Alabama and Auburn football game. What are you talking about? 40 miles? <laughs> Jeez. It's all about priorities, dear heart. It's all about priorities. I'm in the book of 1 Thessalonians. We just started. You want to study? You want to study a, a great book on evangelism and soteriology and eschatology? Ooh, my, my. Your spiritual gift is important because it's a member of the body. Well, I can't find a church I like. Well, what a miserable excuse. I can't find a church I, I like. Listen, you are a church. You're a mobile church. The moment, geez, the moment you believe the gospel of Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, you became a member of the church of Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.27 says you were baptized into Christ. 1 Corinthians 12.13 says, and you were baptized into the body of Christ, the church. You're already a member of the church. 
but your gift is not functional because you're not local with it. Ah, well. I know. Well, I've been to church 40 years. Not this one. <laughs> I've been to church 40 years, never heard anything. If you'd have been in this church, you'd have heard it for 47 years. <laughs> Every year. I don't know. I can't. I don't know. I don't know. Why do you choose the church you choose? I don't know. It's especially important. Spiritual gifts is especially important to those who are working, who are worshiping together and serving in the Lord. What is your gifted ministry? You have a supernatural gifted Holy Spirit ministry. A gifted ministry. Well, I don't know what God wants me to do. I can tell you if you'll read these things, he's, he's already gifted you with a ministry to the local church. Eh, 1 Corinthians 7, you know, I don't know. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, for the common good of the church. Your gift is for the common good of the church. If you just study the Bible a little bit, you get this stuff. I mean, you got to read 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. Is that too much to ask? I hope not. There, are no, there is no such thing as, well, Ron, I don't think I have a gift. There's no way. It's one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit of salvation. Everybody has a spiritual gift. Read 1 Corinthians 12. My, my. Remember that the church of Jesus Christ is both local and universal. There's churches. You, listen, you go to a foreign nation, you'll find a church. A church of Jesus. If missionary work is going on, you will find a church of Jesus Christ. This both local. You should be a local part of a church, and your ministry is specific to that church, but yet your gift is universal if you get connected with other believers. Mine is connected to this church. But listen, I teach. I go over the Internet. I go out and visit and teach. People say, well, you come and teach, yada, yada. And I, if, I've got, if I've got the time, I do that. My gift will serve the body of Christ, but specifically, it's local. I'm a pastor of Doctoral Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. But I've been all over the United States teaching. This is my local church. Remember also that your spiritual gift is for the common good, verse 7 of chapter 12. In 1 Corinthians 12, 17, Paul says, If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body was hearing, where would be the sense of smell? Your gift is for the body. That, that's, that's Paul's point, the point I'm making. Paul says in chapter 12, verse 20, remember I asked you to read 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27 for next week? For now, he writes, for now there are many members or spiritually gifted ministries, but one body. Your gift is for the body. It's not for, your ear is not for the ear. Your gift is not for you. It is for the body, both locally and universal. You ought to read now, after you get through with verse 27, go on down and Finish it out. Read 28, 29, 30, where he says, listen, listen to what he says. It'll make, it'll make a little sense, maybe. I mean, I'll, all I'm trying to get you to where, when you hear this stuff, you go like, oh, yeah, I've heard that, rather than I've never heard that. If you spend any time here, you, you'll be able to say, well, I've heard that. I heard Ron say that. L listen to what Paul writes in 28, 29, and then we're, we're going to go. I need to go eat. 
verse 28. And God has appointed in the church apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts of healing, helps, administration, various kinds of tongues. Now listen to verse 29. And we'll give it to you in the Greek language too. All are not apostles, are they? No. The whole church can't be one gift. I mean, what kind of a body just has an ear? You, I mean, you're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I just found an ear. On pew number one, there's an ear and nothing else. Whoa. I, look, get me a deacon. Is that a real ear? It is. Let's dismiss for about 15 minutes, and let's go find the rest of it. You see how ridiculous it would be? The church is not, oh, wait a minute, there's an ear Every pew has an ear. My, my, my. Come on. Are all are not apostles, are they? No. All are not prophets. No. All are not teachers. No. All are not members, uh, uh, workers of miracles. No. All do not have the gifts of healing. No. Do, no. Do they? No. All do not speak with tongues. No. All do not interpret. No. <laughs> what kind of a body if everybody's got the same part, nothing else? I mean, let me ask you, if you're driving down the road, now we don't do this, but in my day, you used to stop and pick up people that were hitchhiking because they were going from one little place to the next little place down the road. When I get out of football practice at Shelby, I had to walk home. I, I don't know, four or five miles. So from Shelby, I would try to hitchhike to Nuera, and if I could get a, and usually I could get a ride because it was the main highway, Highway 31, uh, like 65. I could usually get a ride there if I wore my Something that said I was from Shelby, my athletic jacket or a shirt, sweatshirt or something. But from New Era out to where I where I was going to Stony Lake, forget it. I'd, I'd have to run home after football practice. But let me tell you, how many times do you think somebody would stop and pick me up if all that was out on the road was a thumb? Maybe a hand and a thumb, and it was doing that. Nothing else. Think you'd stop and pick it up? You might stop to see rest, where the rest of the body is. <laughs> oh, my goodness. See what Paul's trying to tell you. What do you think about that? <laughs> And Paul meant for you to say no. Does everybody speak in tongues? No. Should everybody speak in tongues? No. Why? Because all they got is a tongue. Where's the rest of the body? How is that for the common good? When the common good is, comes from a body. And that body is called the church. The body of Christ is called the church. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us. They've really got to get chapter 12. If they're not willing to study 12, chapter 12 and have an open mind to what Paul is teaching, they're really going to be in trouble when we get to 13, 8 through 10 because they've got to know how Paul divided this up into three groups over here to understand chapter 13. So encourage our hearts to be students of the word of God, Father. We're, we're, we're under the new covenant in the church age. 
And this is dramatic and powerful stuff. I pray you would send us people that have a desire to learn, to study, to let the Holy Spirit teach them. The great teacher is not me. The great teacher is the Holy Spirit. Encourage our hearts, Father, as we come back next week on the idea of spiritual gifts out of chapter 13. In Jesus' name, amen.